Oh no, we need something for the ladies, right? There's this thing that happened last year. I found something. It was very, very, very significant. It was a report that had been put together in 1919 regarding public health in Panama. It had to do in many ways with the construction of the Panama Canal. It was very comprehensive. Had a lot of information. But that's not what I'm going to address right now. This information is from a biography by Barbara Walters. You know, I found a copy of this on the street one day. Or rather, it was at one of those places you go, presumably to apply for a job when you're homeless. I left the book there. I didn't take it. But this is the same book. It's a hardcover. Written in 2008. I'm going to read you a selection. I was in Panama in April 1978 because the U.S. Senate was about to vote on whether to ratify a treaty negotiated by Jimmy Carter and Torrijos that would transfer the sovereignty and eventual control of the Panama Canal to the Panamanians. This was a very controversial issue at the time and had the potential for danger. I had wanted to bring my assistant, Mary Hornicol, with me, but my producer, again Justin Friedland, said no, it wasn't safe. If the Senate vote went against the return of the canal, Americans were not going to be very popular in Panama. And if we, if we had to get out of the country in a hurry, he didn't want to have to worry about anyone but the smallest possible crew. So Justin and I went alone with one cameraman, a sound technician, and an ABC photographer. General Torrijos, whose formal titles included Maximum Leader of the Panamanian Revolution and Supreme Chief of Government, was a charismatic man with chiseled features that spoke of his Indian ancestry. He was said to have the walk of the hunter, meaning that he could come upon you silently from behind without your knowing it. The future of the Panama Canal was at the top story of the time. Everyone wanted to hear from Torrijos. Rune Arledge had dispatched me to try to get him to do an exclusive interview. It was an important assignment, but I was conflicted about being away from New York at what was a pivotal time for me and for ABC News. Rune was about to alter the face of the news radically. It was obvious that Harry and I were not going to make it as a dual anchors. Something had to be done to relieve us of our mutual discomfort, which was getting closer to agony. So Rune's very creative solution was to abandon the idea of two anchors or even one sitting behind a desk. Instead, he said, the position of a sole anchor was dead. It was not, but his proposal didn't seem to placate the naysayers. He was going to have not one, not two, but three anchors to bring the news from their separate locations. He would have as pr the primary anchor in Washington, the very experienced and professional Frank Reynolds, and in Chicago he would have Max Robinson, the first African-American network news anchor. The new boy in town, Peter Jennings, would be based in London. The name of the broadcast would be changed to World News Tonight. As for Harry Reasoner, he was going back to CBS. After much deliberation, Rune had decided that I had a greater future at ABC than Harry did, so re he released him from his contract. Rune was betting that I would earn my salary, and although some in the company felt he was making a mistake, Rune had his own vision, and that vision is inclu and included me. He gave me a new title, not just roving anchor, but chief correspondent for special events, with the authority and, he hoped, the ability to travel the world and land the big newsmaker interviews. Rune was trying to work out the, the timing of this important announcement about the changes in ABC News, and I was very nervous about exactly how this would affect me. In the meantime, Rune sent me off to Panama. When I arrived, I immediately sought out Torrijos' advisors and pressed my case that, as with Fidel Castro, Sadat, and Begin, I would be best able to bring the most attention to their general and his cause. They agreed and promised a brief interview before the Senate vote. That was the best they could do. At the moment, Torrijos was on the resort island of Contadora, where he went to relax and where, by the way, he deposed the deposed Shah of Iran, was brought a year later for temporary refuge after he was forced into exile. I was told to be ready at 7 o'clock a.m. to fly to the island on Torrijos's private helicopter. I landed slightly flustered from a lack of sleep and with bloodshot eyes. But Torrijos didn't seem to care, and although he didn't speak a word of English and I spoke no Spanish, we obviously got through to each other in more ways than one. 
In the interview, the general warned Congress that he would not take lightly a defeat of the proposal to return the canal to Panama. But the big question was, what would he do if the vote did not go his way? Torrijos would not tell me. The U.S. Senate vote on the canal was scheduled for the next day, April 18th, and because Torrijos was so, shall we say, taken with me, I asked him then and there for a second interview right after the vote. He agreed. We were certainly off to a good start. There were hundreds of journalists in Panama all vying for Torrijos' exclusive attention, and we'd gotten it. Justin and I felt quite smug as we choppered back to the mainland. Our smugness didn't last. We waited all the next day for our promised interview with the general. Nothing. The Senate debate was dragging on and on, postponing the vote in our exclusive interview. The, world, the world, word finally came from one of the general's aides that he changed his mind and there would be no interview. Swell. That left me with nothing for the evening news, so we did the next best thing. We did a stand-up in front of the house where it was thought Torrijos was listening on the radio to the debate. That's where the adventure began. A uniformed man suddenly appeared. The general wants you to join him in the house, he directed. I looked at Justin. Go, he said. I'll feed this piece back to New York and catch up with you. Immediately, I was escorted past an incredulous and unhappy group of correspondents from NBC and CBS into the house to spend the rest of the day and most of the evening in the company of General Torrijos. There were no other women in the house, only I and Torrijos' inner circle of military aides and friends. They were all listening to the debate in Washington. The general's interpreter was translating for him, and it occurred to me that if the vote went against Panama, Torrijos might not be very pleased with his now-favored American correspondent. What might he do with me? Hold me hostage? Not a happy thought, but not a crazy one. I was by now fervently hoping that the vote would favor the occupants of the room, especially the general, who made sure I was by his side. We were inseparable for the rest of the debate, and then on the ride to the Panamanian Television Broadcast Center, where he was going to monitor the actual vote. I searched for Justin in the crowd outside the broadcast center, and to my relief saw him waving at me. I also saw the amazed faces of reporters from around the world who were patiently waiting for a simple statement from Torrijos while I was being firmly escorted inside the building by the general himself. He, we went into a conference room where, again, I was the only woman. The vote was being broadcast in Spanish by Panama Radio. Torrijos and his men hung on every number. Most of the time they cheered, so I knew the vote was going as they had hoped. The cheers broke into wild applause when the result was announced. The canal would be returned to Panama. As overjoyed and overjoyed, Torrijos then revealed the real reason he had been keeping me so close to him. He told me, through his interpreter, that if the vote had ended up going against Panama, he had instructed the Panamanian army to destroy the locks on the canal. He had planned to take me up with him in his helicopter to witness the canal's destruction. That would have been quite a coup for me, but one I am glad I didn't get. Who knows how my own country would have reacted. But the agreement was passed, and I felt that I was now free to find Justin and do my big report. The general, however, wasn't through with me. Taking my hand, he led me outside through cheering, jostling crowds to the National Guard headquarters where he gave a press conference. Then he went on to several other celebrations. I don't know how Justin did it, but every time I emerged from some building with Torrijos, Justin was there. At one point, the crowds were so huge that I found Justin waving at me, halfway up a tree. It was all very exciting, but embarrassing. Here were all the networks in the world press chronicling this historic moment, and there was I, smacking their lenses. But there was nothing I could do about it. I begged the general to do an interview with me then and there. He didn't want to, but promised to do one with me the next day. What I had to do then, and as soon as possible, was to get the story of this day on the air, especially his threat to destroy the canal. I finally did, late that night. The other correspondents in Panama were quick to discredit the story, claiming that it was impossible to blow up the canal, and that I had made it up. That really stung, especially because they inaccurately reported my words. What he had said and what I reported was not that he would have blown up the canal, but that he planned to blow up the locks controlling the entrance to the canal, thereby flooding it and rendering the canal useless. Ends on page 357.